Contenders ready! Gladiators ready! Three, two, one! The Gladiators! Hello and welcome to the Glad Pod in association with Gladiators TV. I'm David Blackmore and here, as always, it's well, judging by the amount of emails we've had this week alone, everyone's favourite gladiator, Jet, and of course, producer Paul. Right, let's dive straight into the mailbag. This letter is from James. It just left me, just reading it, there were so many questions. So firstly, he was a huge fan back in the day, and he says it was great sadness that he never went to see a show recorded live, although his dad did take him to see the live shows at Sheffield in Easter in 1995. Now, I'm going to ask you probably the same question to you both, but I'll go to you first, Paul. How did the two compare when seeing the actual show being recorded and one of the live shows? So the live shows at Easter, they were pretty much more like watching the TV show. So it was a lot faster paced because obviously they didn't have to re-record any of the links and worry about the stuff that they do need to for a TV show. So it was kind of... It was a lot shorter, so that was one thing. They would play event music whilst the action was going on, which again was something that they didn't do for the TV show for editing purposes and stuff like that. So hearing the event music as the action was happening in front of you was a lot more like watching the TV show. And then also it gave the producers opportunities to test out contenders, test out new games, and also test out new gladiators as well. So yeah, it was just a lot more laid back, a lot more fun. And obviously a lot less pressure for the guys. Um, I I presume for the gladiators, Di can probably talk to that better than me. But yeah, obviously, because it wasn't recorded for TV, although there were cameras there still recording, but it was just a lot more of a relaxed atmosphere, basically. Yeah, Di, I was going to say that. How did it compare for preparation before the the live show and something that was being recorded because presumably with the stuff that you were recording from TV if you could if you made a mistake just do it again whereas with the live shows presumably um, was there a different kind of pressure for me we couldn't actually re-record anything uh, when we were uh, filming for for TV because it was being a game show it would be, would have been illegal because then it would have been seen to be rigged so that's why they had so many cameras actually recording in any one moment just to, to as a safety really to make sure. But the live events, like Paul said, they, they were just faster. And I think because Kenny Warwick and Nigel had had kind of a showbiz background and worked their way up from being dancers, and dancers are quite interesting because they know what it's like to literally physically put a show on, physically do the show from your lighting design to every moment and beat to the music. So they had a real kind of their acuity, their sense of being able to mount a show was, was ingrained in them. And of course, anybody that they then brought in from gladiators to, to crew would have had to have that same kind of ethos. And I think ITV, Light Entertainment at the time, did it really well. So there we are in the arena. I can't remember Sheffield Arena that well, but I do remember when it was Wembley before they brought the old Wembley Arena down because that's where I had my accident and was scraped off a crash mat and taken to hospital. However, the shows were slick. They were much faster. And what I, what I remember, both of you, and I don't know if anyone listening can remember this, if you were at a live event, the bits I used to love were when we had a break and we were sort of just doing a little bit of a change around, maybe with a bit of set and rigging, because again, it was so cleverly thought out, thought, thought out at the time that you didn't have to do the big screen, uh, big kind of shifts in what what we'd see as scenery or rigging the events. So they'd bring audience members down. I remember they'd always get Jeff, Shadow, out into the arena with a pugil stick and, and get some tiny boy or girl just kind of play pugilistically with him and there was all sorts of other things we get little girls and boys down to do uh, with g-force cheerleading with big pom-poms and i used to love that bit it was kind of the bit we couldn't do when we were filming with the tv so much because it, there was so much pressure on that it had to, we had very strict timings and time was money because we were filming live as i said on on, on 35 mil i think pre-digital so with the live events we just had that kind of Uh, flexibility and ability to really kind of interact with the audience and and get that little bit more from everybody and it created a really special atmosphere do you remember that Paul? Yeah definitely and one thing that just sprung into my mind was also that the live events were filmed in order so you got the intro 
Ulrika and Fash coming out and inter- interviewing the contenders and then the events, which, as you said, were kind of very carefully placed so that the turnaround of, of when they were rigging the events and stuff, that it was shorter. And um, Whereas when they were filming at the NIA, sometimes they would film out of order just to make up the, the whole kind of speeding up of the process. So sometimes you'd go into the arena and the pyramid would be the first thing that you would see. And then they'd film the contender interviews after they'd taken the pyramid down just because it took so long to kind of rig that up. So it was definitely like I said earlier, you kind of saw it more as a TV show rather than the filming of the show. And as I mentioned a bit earlier, something that's been quite a common theme recently was that Jet was his favourite gladiator. Right, but this is where it's just my mind just gets blown. So James is, is always been sorry not to have met you die, but, and, and wait for this, his dad paid for him to have a photo with you, Jet, but it was digitally <laughs> superimposed. James, do you still have this picture? Who's, I, I just can't get, so are you suggesting that, that you your dad found a picture of die with another glad fan and your dad paid to have your head on this on this child like i have to see this picture now because or in my head i've just got this vision of like someone else's body with your head <laughs> a picture with die which is is it still pride of place in your house i need to see it james all right and i know just speaking about your dad i know how much gladiators meant to you because you got to watch it with your dad who i know sadly passed away a few years ago and I think there are many people listening to this who will have similar memories of watching the show with loved ones whether that be parents or or grandparents who who are no longer here and actually I'm glad that you said that listening to the podcast has brought back some 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 happy memories you you had together and and I'm, I'm so glad we were able to do that for you and one memory that he has had is that James goes on to say that he still remembers for his birthday in November 1993. And I, I mean, I can barely remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, let alone remembering what's November 1993. But he says that his main present was a twin cassette player and it must have been recording device as well. Uh, he also got the return of the Gladiators album. Paul, presumably you've got this album. Was it any good? I absolutely loved all of the albums. So there was actually three Gladiators albums released over the uh, entire UK run. So... And the, the first few, I think, sold really, really well, which is why they kept doing them. And it was a mix of like all of the classic rock tunes and, and music that was played during the recordings at the arena. I guess they were kind of put together by Muff Murphin, who was a genius with the Gladiator music. And the, probably the best thing from the fans was that it featured, obviously, not only the theme tune, but also quite a lot of the event music as well, without any commentary on it. So... I mean, those those pieces of music were just masterpieces anyway. So you can listen to them and they definitely kind of... I, I, I hear a lot of people going to the gym now and having that on their kind of like music as they're working out because it just has that whole kind of atmosphere and kind of gets you really ramped up and stuff. So yeah, definitely loved those albums and the return of The Gladiators, which was the second one, was definitely a classic as well. That particular birthday for James, on uh, it was on a Saturday, which as he quite rightly points out, is a jackpot anyway for any child. But he goes on to describe how he enjoyed this particular birthday and concludes, after watching Gladiators, he recorded his own commentary. Um, now, I used to record my own radio show as a kid, but I never tried to record my own Glad commentary because I think John Sachs was the king at doing it. Paul, did you is, did you do it? Did you used to record your own commentary? No, I must admit, I didn't record my own commentary to it. What I did try to do, which I probably failed at, was I used to try and write down the kind of win, lose and draw stats for each of the Gladiators, which I know a lot of the fans like Daryl Ryan, who, who supplies the kind of the stats for all of our episodes now their brains just can remember who won what on what event and, and my brain definitely wasn't like that but commentary no was was something that I didn't do actually James goes on to say that his favourite game was um, Danger Zone so much so that he used to have the Danger Zone theme as his ringtone and he's had it on like successive phones and that some people do still recognise the theme. I can remember those days when you could actually have like, you could do your own ringtone, not have the the Nokia one. You could have your own ringtone or you buy it. And James, I was laughing at you reminiscing about keeping a diary at school each Monday. Presumably that was the kind of just basically tell your teacher what you have done over the weekend and how your entries always focused around that weekend's program of gladiators and and your with your comments and giving your verdicts on the new games and the new gladiators and all of that. I can remember doing the same, except 
mine at school were always about my football match reports. It literally, it, it would just be a football match report. I always gave myself man of the match. And that would, and the teacher would be like, did you do anything else this weekend? And I'd be thinking, no. And Paul, I know you mentioned in a, in a previous pod that um, at school there was that divide between kind of the American wrestling and sort of Gladiators fans. I'm assuming that you were the biggest Glad fan at your school, but did you, like James, have kind of a Glad influence on every element of your school in terms of pencil cases and your desk and all your folders? I mean, was was it like Glad everything? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I used to walk down the street and people would shout Gladiators, sing the Gladiators theme tune at me and stuff just because they knew how much of a fan I was. But yeah, I used to have Gladiators pencil case. There was a whole stationary set. So you kind of go in... And definitely make sure that nobody kind of wrote on them because there was always a thing at school, like if you left it on your desk and somebody would try and write their name, scrawl their name in it. So I was definitely very protective. And I think probably owned two, one at home to kind of keep it nice and neat and, and tidy. But there was definitely something at school in the 90s where the gladiators had their own bubble gum. And it came with these little stickers and you would basically just see them stuck all over the school. Like literally on every wall, there'd be like a a Gladiator's bubblegum sticker. And that was before the days of like when they then brought out the Gladiator's sticker book, which was definitely a thing that you would go to school and swap. And I always remember having the first sticker book, collecting all the stickers except for number one which was a, a sticker of Ulrika and Fashion. There was a girl at my school, I still remember her name, Vicky Robinson, and she had a spare of the number one sticker and she would not swap because she knew that it would mean that I would have completed my sticker book. <laughs> so quite cheekily, when it was break time, I snuck back into the school and took it out of her desk and stuck it in my book, which obviously wasn't a good thing to do. Don't condone it, but yeah, I just needed to complete it. So I'm really sorry about that, Vicky. But yeah, that was, I, I, I had to admit it. Yeah, sorry. Producer Paul, I am speechless. I didn't. I I thought you were going to offer her money. I didn't realize. You, I didn't know where that story was going. But yeah, she she knew what she was doing. She knew what she was holding back. She did not need the number one sticker. She already had it. She just would not swap it. So I mean, I did try everything. I was trying to give her loads of the shiny stickers. No, she just held on to it because she knew what it meant to me. So yeah, what a bombshell, producer Paul. But. Moving on, something for Die here. James was saying that when Gladiators were on the TV, he was quite a, an overweight child. And it wasn't until he was in his 20s that he began to lose weight and gain fitness. And over the past 11 years, he says he's lost around 10 stone by, by swimming and training in the gym. And he says that Gladiators taught him to work hard, to give everything your best. And if you lost, be gracious in defeat. And Di, I know we've mentioned this on the show before, but this show did inspire not just children, but I think the whole family in terms of getting fit and I guess the benefits of it. And it's, and I think as it was seen from James, that long-term effect that actually when he's got to the point where it's like, right, I need to kind of lose the weight. It's still having that gladiator's inspiration to, to do it. It's about tenacity and consistency. So Thanks for reminding me, David, about that. Just, you know, in order to achieve any goal, it is baby steps each day. You can't just achieve particularly that amount of weight loss, James. Absolutely brilliant. You have to make it a, a change in lifestyle choice. And to be honest, to actually follow a really healthy, you know, probably five days of the week, maybe the weekend, you have a bit of a splurge, go back to pizzas and things if you want. But if you have like an 80% ratio of, of generally just enjoying really good nutritious food because the, the body really wants that. And the body will give you so much back if you actually listen to it and treat it in the way that on a molecular level it, it's wanting. But in terms of training and just being active, I, I think we've, we, we, we've obviously been the, globally, everyone's been in a strange place with what's happened out there. But people have had one thing not totally robbed from them, which is the ability to just go outside and be and move. Otherwise, the, the option is just to sit and be inactive. Our bodies, you probably all, all felt this uh, listening, that you probably, you know, some people took up, uh, you know, fitness on on the internet and uh, or digital teaching that's out there, which can be very, very good. And I think for a lot of people, it shifted something that you then have to integrate into your lifestyle. I know that Hunter and Kim Lightning and a lot of the lads out there still in their 40s, 50s and beyond are just still consistently good at keeping active. And consistency, as James would always say, Hunter, is key. 
So it's, you know, it's not about how well you're doing today. It's just doing a little bit each day or every second day and integrating it into your life. So James, I'm in awe of you. And I'm sure you've probably had some little tips as to how to how to shift that amount of weight. And you probably, your body's thankful for it. Your friends will see a change in energy and outlook for yourself. And yeah, really, really glad. And I'm, I'm proud actually as a show, you know, how many people it did inspire. I think it was a guy called Jody Bunting as well. I think he went on a huge, um, is that a memory for you, Paul? A huge kind of yeah, journey of, of, again, a substantial weight loss. I don't know where or how he is now, Jody, if you're listening to any of these, I wish you so well. A huge character, lovely character, but again, inspired just to, to do, you know, make a life change, a lifestyle change rather that was would hopefully be benefiting him to this day. Who knows? But yeah, for many people... Hats off to, to our show for that. He uh, also says that he's a good level of fitness now and, and would love to be a contender if gladiators were ever to return. Although at 35, his age may be against him. And um, Paul, I'll come back to you in a minute because my question that I was leading from that in my mind just now was how, you know, back in the day, what was the oldest contender age of, of anyone of, of any of any worth but just picking up on this point Di for you you've mentioned a few times on the pod how the contenders got quicker got faster got stronger with each series do you think if gladiators did return today that because I always found that the the gap between the gladiators and contenders I mean I, I think as you said it got kind of each series it kind of closed in a, a bit a bit more do you think that the contenders would pretty much be equals to the glads today in terms of their strength and their speed and their agility and all of that and it probably the only thing that would divide them would be the fact that the gladiators would perhaps be a bit more i don't know tv friendly perhaps with their one-liners or, or something like that i agree i think the only thing that would separate a modern day gladiator to a, a modern day contender would be would be our uniform Simple as that. I think today people's access to knowledge on health and fitness and taking the the you know the, the personal responsibility to get fit and keep fit with so many great outlets, whether it's digital or in a gym and group exercise, there are so many brilliant health and fitness professionals out there. People can achieve their goals so much more easily. And I think if GLADS were, were to be back on, the only thing that would separate us would literally be what we're wearing. It would be a very, very tough arena. Very different, I think, to this day. So as always, people, it'd be great if you can give us a five-star rating and review on iTunes or whatever platform you listen to the Glad Pod on. Don't forget, follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And remember, you can get in touch with us and share your Glad stories by emailing gladpod at gladiatorstv.com. Handing over to you now, Di, to introduce this week's guest. Three. Hello and welcome to GladPod. Out of all of them, this is one I've been particularly looking forward to. As iconic as the gladiators themselves and the show, it wouldn't have been the case without our costumes. They singularly identified us. They became absolutely pivotal and foundation to what the very show and the gladiators themselves was all about. Here he is, Stephen Adnett, the costume designer of gladiators themselves. Welcome. Hi there, Diane. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it's lovely to see you after all these years. And I'm fully clothed. And you're fully clothed. I don't think I've ever seen you fully clothed before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stephen, it is so good to see you and hear you. And of course, for the many, many glad fans out there, they're finally putting a face to the man who who basically gave the show its image. What does that feel like? Just just to look back and think, you know, I, I actually created how they looked. It, I think it's very strange, actually, and nearly 30 years later to look back and think that that's what we were doing because I had no idea at that point that it would still be going in 30 years' time. You know, often you think, oh, things are going to get forgotten, you know, or somewhere down the line it's going to go away. But no, Gladiators has continued. Yeah, I was say, if we go say, if we go right back to the beginning, now... Correct me if I'm wrong here, Stephen, but you originally submitted three concepts, Nigel, what if you go for, for two. two? 
Oh, let's see out of the three that I've got listed. Let's see that which two ones you've got. So you've got the logo ones, obviously, which were used. Yes. The, yes. the white costume ones that were used in 98. and the No, that one wasn't there in the beginning. Oh, there you go. And the other one was the circuit board design. Was that the other, second one? That was the other one. Oh, there we go. It's interesting hearing everyone's kind of journey to, to getting involved in Gladiators. John Sachs, I think, was particularly good from kind of the non- gladiator side and that it was kind of over a boozy lunch that he kind of said <laughs> let me do it so how was it for you so how did you get to the point that nigel said i want these two, two concepts submitted well, he, he did he i actually was asked to do the program when i was at london weekend television which is where it all began uh, in about 19 90, end of 91 92 i think it was we started and i went to meet i knew nigel already because i'd worked with him before and i went to have a chat with him uh, in his office and he explained to me because none of us knew exactly exactly what, well, I didn't, what Gladiators was all about. So I went to see him. We had a meeting, um, which was quite jolly. And he discussed it and showed me images. I mean, images of the things. I think it was already on in America. And then I then said, OK, I will go away and I will do some drawings and I'll come back and see you when I've got the drawings. So I went away and I scratched my head thinking, um, what am I going to do? But obviously with Gladiator names like that, there was one to me that was obvious that you actually did something to do with those logos because those logos were quite like sort of Greek myths, Roman myths, tattoos. It was all there, really. So I did one set of costumes, which for the people I had and started to do those costumes, as, as you saw when, we, um, when, when the show was on, and did all the various names with all the various logos. Doing the logos was sometimes a little bit difficult because I also tried to make each gladiator slightly different so that some had a complete costume. Some of them had like a vest at the top. Some of them had crop tops. Some of them had t-shirt shapes. This proved to be not a problem later on, but of course they always wanted to change it. And then I did that set. So I was really happy with that set of costumes that I really loved. And those were the ones I really wanted to do. Then I thought, well, I better do a second image of something different just to show to Nigel to see what he what his reaction is and what he prefers so I did the circuit one and I did so many of those I then finished all these and they weren't all completely finished I probably did about maybe about seven seven or eight drawings um, of the because we had didn't have all the names by that point or, as well so I then went off to see Nigel again um, and showed him the two sets of ideas that I wanted to do. And luckily, without any, any pushing from me, he liked the one that I liked. So I was happy. He was happy. I was happy. So then it, that was that was fine. That was then decided that I would go away. And then when I had all the names, we did an image for each person. And as I say, we I tried to do I tried to vary them with the stripes and the the sizes of the costumes. It posed somewhat of a problem sometimes because the gladiators. Some of those costumes were quite tiny, and putting putting some of those logos onto very tiny things. It was obviously easier to put a logo on something that was bigger, particularly Jet. Her costume was quite small. <laughs> and I, with her, I thought, do we put a jet plane on? I thought, I can't see a jumbo jet across her breast. Not at all. <laughs> but but I thought, well, a jet engine. So that, if nobody knows, that was a jet engine. <laughs> I thought it was like a Fr Freddy Krueger hand. Which... <laughs> could have been, could have been, could have been. <laughs> <laughs> but amazing. And, and before we go back into the individuals, I just want to, I just, it's on my brain. Like, I had no idea about this circuit. Was that one of Nigel's, the circuit? What was that about? It was just another idea for from me, uh, that just to just to give Nigel another choice in case he didn't want to go down the painting route, you know, because as well as uh, boringly, uh, as well as as um, if he if he did cho chosen the other one, it would have become a lot cheaper. Those costumes that they actually chose were quite expensive costumes because not only did we have the making, we had the dyeing, we had the painting, so they were they were quite expensive costumes. And as you know, after each season, each series, they had to be replaced because you know you couldn't; they were sweaty. They were, you know, there's a little bit of the diet run sometimes because, you know, we, we, we'd got quite a lot, um, a, a lot of stuff going on there. So we changed, we did a new set for every season. And every time you had in a new set, you had two costumes each. So that was quite a lot of money. 
Did it dawn on you during that conception period of just how big this was going to be? And of course, it must have been terribly hard to kind of design off the body. It wasn't until we started arriving in your office and talking to you that you could actually literally almost, it it become three-dimensional. Was there a kind of, what was what was that process like for you from, what is the gladiators? Who are they? I've got to do what? <laughs> Once all the drawings were done, then we had to call everybody in to be measured, if you remember. So everybody came in and we measured everybody, which was a bit of a shock for some people, like, like Warrior, you know, who was enormous. <laughs> so I couldn't, you know, that was my first, first sort of meeting and trying to do a costume of somebody that big. People like yourself and, and Panther and uh, Lightning and people like that you were all fairly normal (laughs) well proportioned but fairly normal and so we we took the measurements and then I had to then obviously go to the people who were going to make them with the drawings and all the measurements and and so we then had to prepare them and they were prepared in white lycra to start with we then had to call everybody in to fit them and we did that at London Weekend Television we had a dressing room there you probably can't even remember this perhaps you all came you all came in and we started to fit now the first person we fitted was again Warrior and and we looked at it, the, the costume just wasn't big enough. <laughs> And we had to do it again and we had to call him in for a second fitting with another costume because nobody realised that with those figures that were on paper that he really was that big, me included. But the people making the costumes were used to making costumes for the Royal Ballet, you know, and people like that who were quite sort of spelt and tiny, even the men. <laughs> so so we called him in again and then we got onto a roll and then we did everybody. Then when they were fitted all in white, we then had to send them away. I then had to go off to the people who um, had to paint them. They were all taken up part. I discussed all the paintings. In fact, I came across some drawings of me discussing these, which were done for LWT's publicity, of me as a young person actually talking to her t- explaining what I wanted with all the um, with all the designs that were on the on the on the lycra. So that was weird. <laughs> well, we we hundred percent need to see if we can get our hands on that picture, and we will share that on social media because I've got the full set and the sketches. Did I kindly send those? What a fool I was! <laughs> but, but Stephen, from from the moment where you get those measurements to it actually being completed, how long does that process take? It sounds quite extensive. Yeah, it, 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 the process probably took about oh I don't know because all the costumes were done all at the same time so you can't sort of say what it was for each single one but probably I would think a, a lot of hours had to go into the painting probably maybe about 30 odd hours maybe more 40 odd hours for the painting then we had the dyeing as well which was added on to that so that's what two three days three days then the making with all the you're probably talking about a week per costume I would think. But of course, it wasn't one costume each week. They were all being done at the same time with more than one person. But it was, it was, which, I mean, making it expensive was the fact that we dyed it and we had to, um, we painted all the, um, all the logos on there, which I think probably later on when the costumes changed, which I think was about 98, we decided to do something else. And that was partly for cost because, you know, Budgets were changing and, and um, I can't remember how much each costume cost, but if you, 600 pounds sort of sticks in my head, but that sounds ridiculous by today's standards. But if you imagine 600 pounds for a costume 30 years ago, that was a lot of money. I know that there was a lot, I, each season there were changes being made to the costumes, but just at that very beginning, just at that very beginning, that first series, how involved were the gladiators? Because I know in future series, a few of them had their own ideas, but... They didn't have any idea. It was just me and it was Nigel. And once, as I say, we tried to make each gladiator slightly different. But of course, once we'd done a series, then we had everybody wanting to, can I just have this a bit smaller? Can I show a bit of more of my body? Can I show a bit more of my arms? I need to see my glutes, my abs, my whatever they're called. They need to see them. (laughs) So of course, I had to then redid them to try to keep everybody happy. Happy, which was I was more I was more than happy to do. I think probably you were less less trouble than some of the others because you started you started off quite small. But some people some people who had like a t shirt shape, some of the guys suddenly wanted it to be even smaller with like a crop top, so you could see all their abs and their 
whatever these are called, biceps and things like that. Right. I think it was, it was about pay. But I mean, we were out there in front of potentially millions doing something relatively dangerous. And, you know, you wanted to play to your strengths and there's not a lot of, lot of, uh, lot of places to hide behind a little bit of lycra. And I think, you know, the, the body consciousness that we have today doesn't even touch, you know, it's, it's off the scale today, isn't it? And I think we all wanted to just feel proud and comfortable in what we were presenting and you were so good at listening to us and yes evolving with us as we wanted and maybe a change because we'd, we'd work more hard at our abs or you know we wanted something else to show that flattered our body and you were so patient with us I have to say a big you know thank you but not everybody was patient <laughs> <laughs> So which costume cut was your favourite and which which one was your your, your least favourite? I didn't really have a least favourite. I mean, if I say if I say it sounds it sounds really corny to say that Diane was one of my favourites, not just because she's sitting there and listening, but she was. And I think she was everybody's favourite with the hair and the flicks and all that. You know, I think she was everybody's favourite at the time. There were one or two of the guys who could be a bit more not difficult, a bit more. You know, the idea was that you, while they wanted to show a lot of their body, because that's what the whole thing was about, it was my job to make sure we had an entertainment program that visually looked okay when it came to how they all looked. So there was, had to be a balance, and you know, but but the balance was quite easy. It was a lot of it was that, that a lot of the girls didn't want an all-in-one piece, like Scorpio had an all-in-one, and I believe that Scorpios we changed to a two-piece. Off the top of my head, I seem to remember that because she wanted to show more of her body. So that was the sort of changes we made. But I think it was good that over the series, the next each series evolved slightly. You know, I think that was a, that was a good thing, um, and we all got to know each other, and then they introduced new people you know so it, it all became it, it was quite good because it wasn't the same all the time every single year that would have been a bit boring wouldn't it there must have been a struggle though to think of sort of a logo for some of the gladiator names like shadow or vogue or raider vogue was a good hard one nightshade we had nightshade I mean, what the hell do you do for nightshade we had i mean what is nightshade it's either a deadly flower or <laughs> well, that's not right so i think we did for nightshade we did a i did like a like a silhouette of a a, a landscape which was shaded, I think, into darkness. I think, I think, off the top of my head. Do you remember the, the also we did a tracksuit, which I think some of you have still got. I still have mine. Do you still wear it? Because I thought I saw something on Facebook recently and it, was it you and was it, was it Cobra? We've got the uh, top, yeah. For a PA, I will, I will put on my, they're just, they're incredible. You- I mean, another weird thing I found when we were doing Gladiators was the fact that Nigel made us all call you by your Gladiator name always. We were never allowed to call you by, you know, Helen or or Mike or <laughs> or, or Diane. It always had to be your your gladiator name. Even when we were in the wardrobe, when we were around, we couldn't refer to you as your proper name. So what happened was we all remember the names, but then I forgot the name that you were christened with. But it worked. It worked. By the way, did you ever get a set of, of the dolls? You know, they made some, Mattel made some dolls. No, but I know a man who has. Really? Because I, I helped them to do that. And they were done like slightly bigger. And I said to them, I would love a set of these, having done the costumes. Never got them. Yes, yes, of course you can have a set. Of course you can. Never got them. Over to you, Paul. Paul, has Paul got them? What? What was your what was your charm then? Were we just horrible people? <laughs> <laughs> of course not. No, so I've got all of the um, actual your sketches that were sent to Hornby. Um, they appeared online a few years ago with all of the documentation about how the the toy line came together. So I, I kind of own all that now, and it's yeah, pride of place. I'm I'm going through digitizing it, but yeah, it was amazing how they scaled down your amazing costumes down to these little figures. We need we need some of these pictures of these dolls i would love to see them love to see them because i i never saw a set would be amazing because i i just saw them in clay form when they were like bigger than the actual doll we did them at sort of probably about 12 inches high when we originally did them or eight 12 inches was that what you know when we had to have those 3d scans is that the clay dolls then was that what came of that probably i mean i was just presented with the with the eight 12 inch high figure which we then had to do the costume on that figure and then they were obviously made into smaller dolls yeah do you know where the prototypes ended up 
Paul would be onto that. Yeah, unfortunately, the prototypes looked a lot better than the actual dolls that were mass produced. Well, you could get more detail. I don't know why they didn't do the big ones. When you think of things now like He-Man and that were and all those sort of things that are the size that they were or even bigger, that you could have actually done that now. But then I suppose maybe you just didn't. Maybe maybe they just weren't around at that. Time. No, I'm still trying to find out from Hornby Hobbies. Um, I've got a few of the hand painted ones of the internationals, but apparently they're locked locked away in some vault somewhere, which I'm trying to uh, uncover. But yeah, I've, I've got some photographs of them, but that's that's as far as I've got so far. Um, but Stephen, I met you briefly in 2008 for the, um, we were doing interviews for the Sky One version of Gladiators. And I was doing my interview after you were doing and talking about the costumes with the with the producers and stuff. And that was the first time that I ever saw your amazing sketches, what you'd done of the costumes. And I always remember seeing two Gladiators uh, sketches that I'd never, ever seen before, which was one for a female gladiator called Venom. And she had two kind of snakes coming up the costume. And Panther was actually a male gladiator, a male costume. And that was just fascinating to me to think, wow, those were kind of obviously intended to be gladiators and 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 they changed it around. Do you happen to know who they were intended for or were these just literally names out at the time? I don't, I have no idea who they were intended for. I never had any names for these people, just the the idea that they were female and they were male and then they swapped them around. And I always wondered if they changed or swapped Venom because obviously we then had Cobra who was a late addition. Yeah, yeah, that's why Venom was changed because Cobra came along and you couldn't really have a Cobra and a Venom. It was a bit close together, wasn't it? And then of course, Helen got the, uh, the Panther costume in the end yeah and the logo is still there yeah yeah but i mean a lot of these things are like tattoos you know i base them on tattoos on like i said greek myth mythology roman mythology like the helmets and things for warrior that was taken from a greek a greek painting so you know they all they all were there really there was three uk gladiators that unfortunately never got those amazing costumes they were blaze who was eunice who she was on trial at, at sheffield um, arena and she had the um i don't know if you remember the like the temporary costumes that the the trial gladiators got with the just the g on the front so she was one and then there was diesel and vulcan who came along when we swapped the costumes around and it had the new kind of white costume design what emblems do you think that they would have had i know it's kind of putting you on the spot a little bit but i've got a feeling we, we did one for Vulcan, but I can't be a hundred percent sure. Yeah, maybe I didn't. Maybe I didn't. Um, <laughs> I can't see one here. It's a long time ago. No, I can't see a Vulcan. Because that's one thing that the, the fans have always wanted to see is what those costumes would have been if they were in the classic original style. Yeah. Well, I didn't do any extra extra work if I didn't have to. I had lots to do anyway. <laughs> Going back to those very early stages, you, you obviously needed to have some form of team around you, Stephen, as well, to, to trust that what you were creating was going to be made in the way that you wanted. Who was it that you drew close to? Because I remember uh, the German lady. Yes, Mathilde. She, she was the one... That I did all the paintings and she she worked for, she had her own company called Theatre Textiles. She's no longer with us, sadly, but she was amazing. And not only did she do lots of me for Gladiator, she also did a lot for me with Dame Edna and people like that. And Torvald and Dean, she did an awful lot for me over the years. And also she, I used two people making the costumes, Suzanne and Leslie, who, who are still going. And they were from the Royal Ballet because uh, they made an incredible leotards and things. As we went over... Over the years, then we, we then used other people, like a lady called Rita Best was used to make some of the later ones when we changed them all completely and we lost the logos completely. Although I lost interest a bit when the logos had gone. But it was coming, I think it was coming to the end anyway then, wasn't it? One question that I had, Stephen, is all the guys, except Saracen, Raider and Shadow, they all ended up in sort of one... Well, they, they were in two piece, and obviously the, the men had the rest of them had one piece. Why were the two piece costumes so unpopular for the men? Oh no, the two, they they liked the two piece. They liked them because they showed their abs. They wanted that. But what I got to think is, you couldn't have everybody trooping out wearing exactly the same shape costume. So while we did a two pieces and one piece, we also did different tops. 
So you had thin straps, thicker straps, you had sleeves, no sleeves. So it was that trying to make a variation and not a uniform look, even though, I don't know, in hindsight, it might not have mattered because they had a logo on which was individual anyway. So it might not have mattered, but in my head, it did. Did you ever, I mean, it must have been lovely when we actually started to come in and you could actually do, I remember the whites the complete blank white, the fittings, the very early fittings, something like Micah Hearn, Warrior Walking. <laughs> what were those early days like for you in terms of, obviously you said the workload was just suddenly mounting and mounting and you, you must have had a lot of pressure on you at one point as the, the shooting dates were coming in, were, were drawing in. Yeah, if, if, you, if you remember, we did a photo shoot originally. So the costumes had to be ready probably about two weeks before they were required. And we all trooped off one Saturday morning to Kentish Town to a studio. And and that was the first time I think each gladiator had seen their costume and that I had seen it completely finished. So that was absolutely fantastic. That was really exciting to see everybody. And I think everybody came in singly and they all had their picture taken. And then they did group shots, you know, like the group shot that you did so often of everybody together. And I was really proud of it. And I was, you know, I was thrilled to see it all together and a bit relieved that, you know, in two weeks time, it was going to be all right. Of course, the job didn't stop then because we had all the contestants to deal with as well and we had although they theirs weren't made they were they were but I think they were they were actually supplied by people so that got into marketing rather than me so but you know there was all that to get together and and everything and um and then I I do remember when we got up to Bur- to uh, Birmingham seeing the whole thing for the first time was just incredible because the size of those games was unbelievable and uh, and it was just like something else that we'd never ever seen before and the noise the music you know Nigel did a great job even though we didn't always see eye to eye he, we he he did a great <laughs> maybe no one did <laughs> he uh, he did a great job with, with the whole concept and also i don't i don't know if you remember but that first show when we recorded it it was going on and on and on and we were still there at one o'clock in the morning and you were still having to perform and do all those things at one o'clock from about seven because the whole thing was taking so long to get those huge games in and out that it was it was like Crazy, crazy. It did quicken up. I was going to ask you about the lighting. It's, it's Stephen Pierce, wasn't it? He, the, how he yeah. lit to, to. So our costumes almost were were made for that lovely blue red moody it was a glamorous he had a job on a job and a half i think with that huge arena and having to light everything as he did and two presenters and every people in close up then the whole thing it was quite quite a task quite a task but i think it it made us all feel very satisfied and pleased with it when it was all done so i think it was great just going back to the first photo shoot when you were talking about how they kind of came to Kentish Down um, to have those first shoots which is really weird because that's where I am now that's where I live so that's that's really I didn't know that but I seem to remember being kind of a 10 year old as I was at the time and you might be able to correct me on this but Warrior I seem to remember that he spilt coffee down his top just before the photo shoot and I remember on the photos that it's kind of he had this brown stain over his kind of logo part and there was kind of people writing into the gladiators magazines going why's warrior got a brown mark on his costume or folding his hands to kind of hide it I I can't remember that thank god I can't remember that there was always that always that problem because they only had two costumes each so if anything happened to one like I remember for instance when when warrior was um, he injured himself in the hamster ball as we used to call it. And he had to go off to hospital. And all I was bothered about was, what are they going to do to the costume? Can I have it back? Can I have it back? We only had one more and they cut it off him. I was devastated. No, we only had one then for the rest of the series. Luckily, not luckily, luckily for me, not for him, that he didn't come back to the series, I don't think, that time. So we, we were okay. <laughs> Isn't that awful? They could only wear them for one show. And then, and then they had to be then washed and cleaned by the wardrobe team. And then they wore the next one the next day, you know, then that so on and so on. What about the cost, uh, the contender costumes? The contender costumes at the beginning were used by... It was London Weekend's marketing team that got, that got a company to actually supply. Um, so they, they were quite 
basic, if you like, if you remember. And they got a team to supply them for free, I believe, along with the shoes. Asics used to do the shoes, I believe, used to supply all the shoes for everybody. So that wasn't really, it was taken out of my hands a little bit because that was um, not happening. But further down the line, probably round about 97, 98, I actually did do the contenders as well. And we did have them made. That's when we were doing cheaper gladiator costumes. And you were saying about the fear over like you know any of the gladiators damaging or ruining their their costumes now one consistent theme we've had throughout this this podcast has been the use for some gladiators of something called bum glue oh yes bikini bikini bite that's what it was called yeah that was awful that was awful because they used to obviously when you wear lycra it it, it, it gets warm and it and it, it expands slightly to the warmth of the body well if you put this bikini bite on your bottom or wherever you want it on your body it doesn't expand where the bikini bite is so you had baggy little areas where it was stuck to the body and then a little bit loose around where the bikini bite was. So I wasn't a lover of that. But having said that, I do appreciate why you had to do it sometimes because the costumes would move and some of those things you were doing, you know, you didn't want to show everybody everything. So, you know, and they were tiny. Bit of the bane of my life, that stuff. The funny thing is, <laughs> I, I own a, a few of your costumes. Well, I say a few, probably about 20. Can you believe that I was stupid enough to throw some away? They'd be worth a fortune. Can you believe? When we all finished at London Weekend Television, I kept quite a few and, and, and they had to be thrown away because there was no they nowhere to put them. So, uh, and I wish I'd have kept, oh God, I wish I'd have kept them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, the question what I was going to come on to was basically when I got them and they arrived and I was kind of sorting through them, there was all of these like little bits of plastic and I was kind of like, what's all of this plastic? I realise now that it's probably dried on bum glue that was stuck onto the costumes. Well, it could have been, although, you know, you know, when women buy swimwear, they, they it has a... It has like a little thin piece of plastic that holds to the body around the legs and around the top. And we we put that on the, some of the costumes as well. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm hoping that's what it was and not the bum glue. <laughs> Mind you, you could never get that bum glue off. It, it, it's true. And it was, you know, it was either that or things riding up your bottom as well and girls being in an unintentional G-string. Yeah. No, but yes. I have tight your glutes were or defined you'd get your body fat level two you yeah. know you, you needed your modesty covering yes and also it was hard because i mean we we had to you had to have your modesty obviously on your legs between your legs covered but we you liked it everybody liked the, the leg line as high as possible so the leg line was sort of coming up to the waist and you think well god what's going to happen you know what happens the middle became smaller because it just works its way inwards <laughs> so you you've got to have some way of keeping it together while showing as much of the body as you possibly could. But there's another memory about the costumes, which I, I, I don't know how you felt about this, because, of course, under the very bright, beautiful lighting uh, that the guys did and made the show look so amazing, we had to be very tanned. And, of course, we didn't want to expose ourselves to lots of sunbeds and stuff, because at the time it was like, oh, it's not very healthy. We had to have pro-tan. Bane of your life, I'd imagine. What was that like for you to deal with? Yeah, and it, and it was like it was really difficult, because as well as trying not to get the, the lycra to run the painting, we then had to contend with the, the the brown of the costume. So the brown did stain it. But luckily, the lights being so bright didn't pick up a lot of that brown. But that still happens now, even with all the Dancing on Ice costumes, because they have, you know, like Ballroom, they have all the spray tan, and it used to come off onto those. But where with you were having to wear the costume again and again, at least with Dancing on Ice, they wore it once and never again. So that was, you know, we didn't have to worry too much on that, but it still happens. Out of everything, you have been doing was was glad's one of your most favorite memories in terms of of, of stepping into the field of working with lycra because i would imagine working with lycra within your skill set is a very specific field isn't it yeah i love it i love it anyway because it can be so close to the body but i mean as part of the gladiators well there's a lot you can do with lycra but apart from the gladiators i did i did like an ice ballet with torville and dean which was a lot of lycra i did dame edna we didn't use a lot of lycra for dame edna for obvious reasons but yeah i mean a lot of dance 
dancers. I've done a lot of dancers' costumes over the years. Dancing on Ice, I did the first batch for nine years. I didn't do the second batch. I think nine years was probably enough. But but that was all lycra of various sorts or stretch fabrics. And even now, I'm doing dancers still. I do a Christmas show. I do less and less as I've got older through choice. But I do a large Christmas spectacular thing now. Um, and I have for the past eight years. But yeah, that's that's a lot of lycra for dancers and stretch fabrics and things. So yeah, over the years, I have actually done an awful lot of lycra. From the last series, there were three kind of costume alterations or, or tweaks that were mentioned to us. And I'll just, I'll just run through, through these and see, Stephen, you can remember any of the stories behind it. So we first of all had Rebel, who we spoke to. She had like the white biker lady and she'd asked it to be sort of amended to be perhaps, you know, a bit more appropriate to her skin tone. Then there was Phoenix, who originally had short sleeves, but they were chopped off before filming. And then Trojan, somebody mentioned on the podcast last series that he didn't want his nipple showing, but was told by producers they wanted nipples. Oh, do you know, do you know the... The weird thing about men and lycra is they a lot of them get obsessed, not just on gladiators, about having their nipples showing through. They'll strip off on the beach, but they don't want their nipples showing through on lycra. Very strange. Very strange. Actually, actually, sorry. Can, can I just go back? They weren't the circuit board we talked about earlier. Wasn't the cir- wasn't the circuit board that I, I this was the one. You might not be able to see it. That was the other one. When I spoke to you a few years ago, Stephen, you said to me at the at the time that there was three costume designs. There was the circuit board, the logos, and then that the one that's very closely related to the ninety eight costumes, the white ones, which is the ones that you've just shown us on the, on the the screen uh, which we'll post on social media and then you revisited the 98 ones from the original designs that's what i believe i stand corrected then maybe it was three but i really cannot remember showing nigel three i was very i was very kind if i showed him three because he might have then i gave him more options to choose the one that i didn't want so forgive me <laughs> that's okay what i was gonna say Stephen, is that wolf probably seems to be the gladiator who probably would have needed to have more costumes made because presumably he's were more ripped by contenders maybe than others is 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 that true would he have had more costumes well obviously if they got ripped then yes we had to remake them but i don't remember i remember the odd one being ripped and we had to replace it quickly but i can't oh, on the on the in the long run i can't remember because like was quite tough so i can't remember a lot of them getting ripped <laughs> So Stephen, just going back to the the 98 costumes, just if I may, for a moment, I'd love to know what you thought about them. I know that you said earlier on that it was kind of a cost reason why um, you you kind of moved away from the kind of the logo costumes. But what was the concept behind it? I heard things at the time that was to make the team feel more like a sports team or something like you would wear at the Olympics or something like that. But did you have any? Well, the Americans had their own. Um, I did the I did the South African ones. They wanted new ones, and I did the was it the Russians who came? Did I do the Germans? I can't remember if I did the German one or not. Because some of them already had gladiators in the country they were in. So that's why the Americans, they came with their own. And the, the Russians didn't, and nor did the South Africans. And I don't know whether the German ones did. I'll have to go through all my... You can imagine how many drawings I've got piles of. Usually I keep the gladiators ones together, but because I, 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 they were separate for some reason, I don't know why. There's two questions from me, Steve, and two questions I, I kind of really wanted to ask. And what did you think of the revival? gladiator costumes i don't have to have a political hat i thought they were horrible but you know i am slightly biased why did were you were any of you involved well no <laughs> no no but you know it's someone else's work you know you i you may have felt like you wanted to keep a straight bat well i guess i guess from your point of view as well coming up with those original um designs for what the show was to become how iconic the show was and how iconic the the outfits were as well to then have that eight years later presumably from your and almost tarnished really so it didn't have the impact that the new one had i mean when you think the new one must have finished for a reason and and to to run anything for sort of nine or ten years is is incredible and i think come that point it's rare i think okay we did blind date for 18 years but that was slightly different but i don't think there are that many programs that run for that long and don't lose something of their impact i mean even now you get you get things like Ninja Warrior, which is the close thing to it, I suppose. But it's not Gladiators by any means. And you've got the new Gladiators, which I sort of 
I mean, you know, I, I, it didn't do it for me, I'm afraid. But then I was involved in the first and only one, as far as no, I know. No, it was. I actually felt for them because it was something about the gladiatorial, the, the the size of the gladiatorial original, the NIA for that. But I understand budgets and a different angle and different view. Yeah, it was different times, different times. But no, I mean, one or two of the people in wardrobe and the wardrobe staff for hours, one or two of them worked on it. But Kevin, do you remember Kevin? He worked on it. One scene never forgotten. But but yeah, ours was the best. Uh, it, very true and I just remember actually it was coming into makeup and coming into wardrobe that for me many times during film because I put a lot of pressure on myself to want to really in those 30 seconds or that one minute of filming an event I really wanted to win you know and be safe because it was a dangerous place to work at times I put so much pressure on myself to want to be the best athlete I could be because I knew I had the potential and I always wanted to prove it to myself more than anyone first uh, and win and so when coming into wardrobe to be with you guys and makeup was just like always light relief. Then you were thrown to the lions, no problem. <laughs> so Stephen, just going back to the the ninety eight costumes, just if I may for a moment, I, I would love to know what you thought about them. I know that you said earlier on that it was kind of a cost reason why um, you you kind of moved away from the kind of the logo costumes. But what was the concept behind it? I heard things at the time that was to make the team feel more like a sports team or something like that for, for me no for me there wasn't really a concept it was a question of doing something else in order to make it more affordable basically and, and also maybe after nine years eight years uh, maybe it became a little bit tired Maybe we needed something else to look at. And while I didn't mind them changing, and it wasn't my decision anyway, I, I certainly didn't, I, I didn't object to it, but I never found them as interesting as the first batch. But that's quite often with anything, isn't it? The first time you do something is obviously the favourite, and then you do something later on, and it's never going to take over what you've done originally. Absolutely. In the event that maybe a show like Gladiators was to come back, and you were to do the design on the costumes, would they be that different from the originals then? Oh, my goodness. I don't know. I don't know. They'd have to pay me more money. But I, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to do something else, wouldn't I? You couldn't repeat it because I think it would be unfair for the program and unfair for each gladiator to have their their logo, their own logo, which was their own, used for someone else in any form at all. So unless the names were completely different, then you could do it. But I doubt whether anybody's going to come back to me and say. Stephen, you were saying about, you know, our Gladiator show being the best. So when the American and the Australian Gladiators came over for the International Series, what did you make of their costumes? They were good. No, they were good. They were good. The Americans were loud, but that goes without saying. Um, the Australian, no, they were they were all good. They were good. The Australians were lovely. The Americans were loud. The Russians were different. They were built differently. The ladies in the Russian team were quite large, muscly, big, and I think they were. A lot of them didn't speak English, so that was a bit of a problem. But they were quite happy with what what I gave them. Oh, they didn't complain. One person we spoke to in the last series who didn't make it onto the show was Shark, and he wasn't quite sure about it and uh, you know i don't want to put you on the spot like I, we have done consistently over over this podcast but do you recall ever having put a shark costume in place no we never had a shark we never had any fish or mammal fish if you'd ever been a gladiator what would have your name been what would my name be oh my god perfect i'm not quite sure about the logo for that i'm adding a lot here if i'd have been a gladiator then i might have been called wimp <laughs> So there we go, Stephen Adden. Now, he's a name, Di, that we have brought up probably from episode one as someone that we'd love to um, hear from on the Glad Pod. And for you, it must have been great to sort of, well, first of all, catch up with him after all these years and, and two just delve a little bit deeper as to the work that he did for gladiators oh absolutely it was like coming home seeing him and i actually got a little kind of butterflies in my tummy because obviously when you're going into costume that means like filming's getting close so the whole vibe back of the arena going into costume going into makeup and you we had these see-through plastic bags of which i still have one with your with a bit of gaffer tape on white and your or your name, Jet, in my case, are just hand hand written in capital letters on it. And in that said see-through big white plastic bag, you have all your bits, all your extra guards for your elbows, your shin pads, 
neck guard, everything, and and uh, and your costume, which would be on a, a hanger as well. But then you kind of kept everything together in that. And for me, when I, as soon as I saw him and I heard his voice, I'm like, oh, those memories come flooding back because he was so in love, in particular, about his costumes and his work. I think I, whether was he given the right parameters to work within? I think he might have felt there was some pressure on him because it was such a high profile show, and he was he seemed to really care about what he'd been commissioned to do and he had a lovely team with him to do it but really wanted to put his own creative ability in there and be given the time and space to do it I got the impression sometimes he's a bit corralled into certain corners to cut corners and he's like no I'm doing it my way or no way and I'm really glad he did in the end and he stood up for his vision for the beautiful colouring for the lighting to, to, to go with the lighting of the show and they have become quite iconic, haven't they? I'd love to see other people now, adults, in the costumes if they could if they could get them. But then that was never to be, was it? They've missed a trick, haven't they, by not selling official gladiator costumes like replicas for uh, fancy dress parties and cosplayers. Because one thing that you do see on social media a lot is people recreating their own versions of these costumes. So I think like ITV licensing has missed a massive trick and they probably could still sell it to this day, to be honest. Probably not the £600 that each of the costumes actually cost. We'd have to obviously make them that they could be probably washed in a washing machine, which I know that the uh, original Gladiator costumes were definitely not allowed to, they were dry clean only. But I think, yeah, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? I think they definitely need to to create some licensing for the 30th anniversary, perhaps, of, of, of these costumes. Which costume would each of you be daring enough to even put on now? I don't know. I think I would probably not want Trojans because he was definitely had too much nipples going on. So I think I, de- <laughs> I definitely wouldn't want him. I'd probably want an f- all-in-one piece to just try and hold me in as much as possible, I think so. <laughs> um, maybe a wolf or a cobra. Oh, Cobras was quite skimpy though, wasn't it? May- may- maybe wolf, I, w- I would think. Or maybe Hawk from series one. His was pro- probably more covered, wasn't it? Although, no, his was quite nipply as well, so... Oh, <laughs> maybe Saracens when he had that. Oh no, but his was a two piece. But yeah, Saracens when he had the shoulders, shoulder ones from series one, perhaps. But it's quite tough, isn't it? Well, the, you've you've just given like the the ultimate pageant answer in that you've basically listed everyone. So then I for I can't mention anyone. My gut instinct was Saracen, but I've just looked at it again, and I f- I'm not saying that Saracen looked like a girl in any stretch of imagination, but I think on me. I, because I haven't quite got that same physique, I think it would make me look like I was just like a a little girl is what I think I'd wear. So then I was thinking maybe Hunter just because then it covers, it covers up, it it covers up the belly. Well, it puts it more on show then, isn't it? But yeah, no, it's a tough one. We we must, we, we should try and see. Well, first of all, I wanted to say was if people listening have got pictures of them in, like if they've made one themselves, we definitely want to see those pictures. And if there was a particular outfit that you've not been able to replicate, but you would like to try, I'd love to hear about that as well. Gladpod at gladiatorstv.com. But Di, yeah, which which of the men's outfit do you think would potentially work for men who perhaps aren't in the best physical shape of their lives? I think you've mentioned the, the only one already that would probably do, but they'd probably have to make it into a complete one piece. A, a unitard would be to join Saracens up top to bottom. Then you'd just be in a short sleeve leotard. So I don't know. I think Mickey, Cobras, uh, but yet yeah, got nipply. I don't know. I think the boys... They just wanted to show as much as possible, and rightly so. So maybe we need to do a bit of a reinvent, or if anyone, again, has got any ideas for new uh, gladiator costumes to this day, based on some of the characters they've seen and loved over the years, why not? Let's keep the energy going. (laughs) Yeah, that's a really good point. So if we still have the original theme in terms of the look of them, but perhaps so that they're a bit slightly different or maybe more mainstream. You can make it more mainstream, but maybe you could, you know, give them people the sleeves if, like me, you haven't got much in the way of biceps. Things like that could could work 
really well, I think. Oh, I like this. Hopefully our mailbox is going to be full. And actually, I think maybe we should look to cover it a bit more in perhaps series three, perhaps do it a bit more about um, costumes again. The, the one thing I did like about Stephen, though, was, I, I, I mean, most of the people we've been interviewing have, have become well prepared. They've, you know, made a few thoughts of some of their stories and then some of them have just flowed naturally. But Stephen like, was properly prepared, Paul, wasn't he? Like he had the designs next to him. Yeah, and I mean, I'm lucky enough to own some of those costume uh, sketches what he did and they're probably my prized possession to be fair because they're just so intricate with the details and the, the way that he's like you say designed that the icons for each of the gladiators and I loved how he kind of described them as like tattoos and, and Greek mythology style paintings which like I say they definitely had such a kind of such an iconic art direction around each of the the icons that the gladiators had. So I could, like say, even though I own some of them, I could, I still wanted to see the ones that he had in front of him as he was kind of flipping between them. But yeah, it was great. I still want him to design the costumes for the gladiators that we didn't get to see, such as like Blaze when she was like obviously Eunice Hut Hart. Um, she she wasn't lucky enough to kind of get to that stage of having an icon on a costume. And there was uh, Diesel and Vulcan in the in the later years where the costume designs had changed. So yeah, Stephen, if you're listening back to that, please, if you've ever got any downtime, do a few sketches for those ones to just finish off the collection. That would be great. Th- those costume sketches, if he ever did release them, would just, I know a lot of the fans would love to get their hands on them as well. And I did love how he was very honest, very straightforward with his dislike for the Sky Revival costume designs. But then if you're creating the originals, you know, you're always going to think that uh, that yours are the best, but good on good on him for, for sticking by that. But die. The thing that came up again, I didn't think it would come up in costumes. Like thinking about it, it does make sense. Bum glue, or uh, was it bikini bite that he mentioned instead? I, I, I've, I've got that written down, but I, I can't quite remember. And also the the tanning as well um, ruined the was ruining the costumes. He was saying, were you aware of the the tanning element of what he was talking about? Die. Oh yes, I can't remember. It's pro tan. It was one of the very early kind of very deep tans made for pre- pre- predominantly uh, for bodybuilders uh, under very bright lights on stage. So all our hard work of getting definition and all those things bodybuilders do would be highlighted by also having a very deep tan. And but this stuff was like a dye on your skin. And uh, so I'll come back to the costumes in just a sec, but in the hotel, we were in a really nice hotel in central Birmingham, the Hyatt Hilton. And you'd look like, you know, like litmus paper when you're doing science at school when you were younger. And you could put a blot of ink and it was sort of like an aura, auric field of like pink and blue and green as it would dilate away from where you put it. So you'd have like these, like like an American crime scene where they did like a, you know, they'd put a white mark around the whole body. So on, in our sheets in the morning, you'd look back and go, ah, oh, there's a human litmus rainbow of me there imprinted on the bed because the dye would seep out off your skin as you're sleeping in the night. And the hotel were up in arms about this dye doesn't come out of our expensive sheets, etc., etc. But there was nothing we could do to really get around that. And we'd have like pro-tan parties where we'd all kind of, well, I didn't enter any pro-tan parties, but where you'd have to do each other's backs, if you, particularly boys, if they couldn't reach, which they couldn't. It's quite a lot of mass there as well. So pro-tan wasn't our best friend and it stank like a biscuity, which I think lots of false tans have to this day. And it, yeah, it would get all over the costumes, which was awful because, you know, you've mentioned everything had to be hand washed. And then, of course, bum stick. <laughs> There's no other word for it, really. Oh, they call it bikini bite these days. So what we would do, we just around the, 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 the corners and the edges of our costumes, just put this sort of sticky glue to keep the costume on you rather than riding up through your cheeks or, you know, wherever else your costume may ride. <laughs> oh, the memories. And Paul, the, the, the last few bits I just kind of made notes of here that I just wanted to rattle through, just talking him talking about the, you know, the white 1998 redesigned costumes, cost-saving reasons, didn't seem particularly keen on, on them. It's almost like he was kind of like, well, you know, fair enough. You've had my brilliant designs and you can just kind of have these now. And then him talking about from series two, the gladiators wanting to show more body and the costumes evolving over the series to get smaller and smaller. Uh, do you know what? I was so pleased to hear that he wasn't keen on those those white, 
costumes in 98. I think a lot of the Gladiator community look back on those photos and that series and it's just a shame because a lot of the identity of the individual Gladiators kind of was lost as soon as those logos were taken away. So to hear that Stephen, even though they were his designs, he wasn't that keen, was quite a nice thing to go. It kind of validated everybody's thoughts on those. And then, yeah, as for the costumes getting smaller, there was always a running joke in the in the gladiators kind of newspapers and magazines of the ever shrinking costumes like each year they would get tinier and tinier and tinier especially for jet and lightning and zodiac i think each year they they kept vanishing even more especially like you say i think at one point you would kind of in these small shorts that would just li- literally like hung on by one piece of kind of lycra across the top so yeah i don't know how much smaller they, they could have got over the years but yeah, that was always a running thing. I can I can see some of the the newspaper titles now. The the case of their ever shrinking costumes shows a bit about body confidence. If I think back to being in my early twenties and think of the pressure on image and body image for men and women today, to think back, and think I was one of these people who was thinking, no, show more. I want my legs to look longer because they put Barbara Papa, bloody Bridget Jones on me in the first series. And I wanted that line to sort of lift up a little bit and make my legs look a little bit longer. So it was so nice to think back that I must have had incredible body confidence, uh, but I didn't, you know. I was still really hated being in in not very much clothing. I thought, well, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to tan really deep, obviously train and do the right nutrition as best as I can. So I feel confident out there and get on with it and try and aesthetically make the best of what is a very small costume anyway, flatter my body shape. And I think the other girls, Zodiac, Lightning, and many of the others in time kind of got that for themselves too. And hopefully hopefully the fans and everybody else enjoyed it. But Di, just linking back to one of the questions earlier that you managed to successfully dodge, I'm going to bring it back up now, but if you had to have swapped your costume with one of the other girls, or did you ever see a design from one of the other female gladiators and you were like oh i wish i had that costume or i wish i'd gone with that design who would who would you swap with do you know i'd have to go back and study some of the pictures i always loved zodiacs because again she went for that really high leg line and it was a two-piece and i think she had sort of quite a, quite a high kind of halter net, necky neckline didn't she i think that one would have felt quite good at the time in terms of performance for me one pieces remind me too much of being a gymnast as a child no thank you so probably, yeah, I'll go with, I'll go with Kate's Zodiacs. What I want to ask is what guys would put the girls' ones on. <laughs> what about, as I said, I've already done my, my, my punt on what boys' one I would have put on because uh, obviously it just would be wrong to not. Actually, I think Panthers, one of Panthers, where it looked like she had braces on at one point were really cute. Yeah, yeah. She, that, she, that's when the costume designs tried to like change up quite a bit. But I think Stephen did such a good job of like, trying to change things but still making obviously because that was when panther had had her injury so probably had come back and and had to readjust to to being in the arena again so i think obviously they'd worked together but still had quite a lot of personality and it was nice to see like you say how he managed to fit those icons onto such tiny pieces of lycra so with panther for example where she'd gone from the the whole panther on the one piece to then just having when she converted over to the two pieces with the braces how he just had this panther's head like bursting out of this dark shadow i thought it was really clever how he'd managed to to convert those designs over onto the ever-shrinking pieces of lycra. Great. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Di. Um, Another glad pot in the bag. Love this week's. As always, let us know what you think about it and if it sparked any new memories or any questions, particularly, obviously, about the costumes that we can uh, put to Di. Or, look, maybe we'll look to get Stephen back on as well if you you have anything further you guys want to ask. Gladpod at gladiatorstv.com is the email address you need. Uh, Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Twitter and like our page on Facebook. Good competition. Good spirit. Great sportsmanship as both contenders show mutual respect. Join us again next week for the ultimate challenge, the might of...